Uh, I'm Elliot Bledsoe, the Copyright Officer with the Australian Digital Alliance, uh, and we're going to jump straight into uh, the first panel of the day. Now, of course, I don't need to tell this audience, this room, that issues come up in relation to copyright when we're talking about new technologies. Uh, but, of course, technology marches on regardless of copyright. So often in the copyright space, we're playing a catch-up game uh, in relation to the types of activities that are going on around technology. And so the idea of this panel is to really look at some of those technologies and uh, dig through the types of issues that uh, may come up in relation to them. So I'm joined today by uh, Michael Wolf, uh, an advocate for public interest copyright. who will be doing a deep dive into controlled digital lending. Michael should be on screen, hopefully. No, currently we're in an infinite loop of the room. There we are. Good. Okay, so uh, it wouldn't be a panel about technology without technological problems. So hopefully we'll get that sorted. There we are. Michael's on screen now. That's good. Um, also on screen is Professor Ellie Rennie, uh, who is an ARC research fellow working across the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, the Digital, Ethno Ethn bleh, the Digital Ethnography Research Center, and the ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. So all uh, divisions of a university that have the right kind of words in them to be on a panel like this. Um, Ellie's going to walk us through the recently published developments in Web3 for the Creative Industries report. Uh, and here, IRL with me, is Dr. Rita Matalanite. I'm attempting to say that correctly, uh, who is a senior researcher and research researcher in law at Macquarie University. Uh, Rita will be taking us through some of the complexities of copyright in machine learning processes uh, and AI more broadly. Uh, so I'll hand over to Mike first. Kia ora. Uh, can, can everyone hear, hear me all okay? I, it's hard to see, <laughs> no visual feedback, but I, I, I really wish I could be there uh, with you all in Canberra at the moment. Um, uh, bummed to not join uh, in person, but very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you all and uh, engage a little bit on CDL. So with that, I'm going to go ahead. I have slides. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which hopefully will go off without a hiccup. Um, that looks like my screen. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Michael Wolf. I, I do a lot of, I've, uh, my career has been based around advocacy around public interest copyright law. I've done some work with Toa Toa here in New Zealand uh, on the same. Uh, and I have a, a, I am a lawyer in the United States. I have a U.S. law practice, um, although of course nothing here is legal advice and particularly not uh, under New Zealand or Australian law. Um, here today to talk about controlled digital lending or CDL, given that this is a, a copyright conference that's taking place in a library. I, I don't think that this is going to be an unfamiliar topic for many of you. I, I, I hope it's familiar. And I, I also hope that I uh, don't cover ground that's uh, already too too familiar to you all um, that I can uh, give you a little bit of a, a new gloss on some of the ways of thinking about the issues wrapped up in CDL and where we move from here. So um, what CDL is, is essentially it's willful piracy on an industrial scale. <laughs> no, no, sorry. That's not my view. That's the view of Shed Book Group, who is currently suing the Internet Archive in the United States. What I mean to say is that it's not any different than heaving a brick through a grocery store window and handing out all the food. Pardon that again. That was a slip up. That's not that's not me. That's Douglas Preston uh, from the Authors Guild in the United States. Um, what I mean to say is that CDL has the potential to destroy the ebook market. <laughs> Society of Authors UK. Uh, no, no, no. That's um, that's not that's not it at all. What what I mean to say is that what we're talking about, what CDL is in essence, is not really anything more or less than library lending. It's digital library lending in the same way that. Uh, a library that owns a book can, uh, in physical form can lend that book to another person without incurring copyright liability. The basic gist of controlled digital lending or advocacy around controlled digital lending is that a library that owns a digital book should be able to lend that to people um, or one at a time without incurring copyright liability. So hopefully not the same as throwing a brick through a grocery store window and handing out the food. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, it's one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, TPM restricted or technological or technical protection measure restricted. That means, you know, DRM, uh, library lending of digital works. That's it. 
Uh, of course, the industry, uh, cop uh, copyright industries have a very long, have a very long history of making very hyperbolic claims about all sorts of new technologies. Uh, this, this, what I have up on the slides now, which I'll read out loud so nobody misses it, um, uh, is a quote from Jack Valenti, at the time the president of the Motion Picture Association of America, who is speaking uh, in the 80s saying that, I say to you that the VCR is the American film producer and the American public, as the Boston Strangler is the woman at home alone. <laughs> you know, the good news is we don't usually get that uh, over the top these days, but certainly the rhetoric around controlled digital lending has gotten awful close. Um, if there's, even if this topic is relatively familiar to most of you, and I get, again, I, I hope it is, um, one gloss that uh, I might be able to provide here that could be helpful, uh, it is just a framework for thinking about why we have it in the first place uh, and what exactly we're meant to solve. And control digital lending really straddle or standing uh, uh, or position to approach two distinct problems. You have uh, this concept of the 20th century black hole, but also this, this newer one of a 21st century electronic cage. So by the 20th century black hole, again, hopefully this is familiar, uh, but it's this concept that you have a large volume of commercially unavailable copyright works that are also subject to very long copyright terms. So in essence, if, if there is a commercial work that was once published, but no longer is published, that's out of print, that work is generally quite hard for consumers to get their hands on. It's also a work that can't take advantage of digital distribution methods, methods and digital availability because its copyright owner has not taken the necessary steps to have that work digitized, made available and back in commerce. And often there's very little incentive for them to do so. So this is empirically, and there's been some really great empirical research about this, um, uh, particularly from Professor Paul Heald uh, in the United States. Uh, but you can see pretty dramatically that the number of works uh, really goes off a cliff um, in the middle of the 20th century. So uh, once works are in the realm of copyright, so I think in, in the United States, it'd be from the late 20s onward, but uh, elsewhere it can be scattered a little um, uh, here in Australia and, and in New Zealand, it can be more in the middle of the century. But those works um, that are on the older side of that copyright life cycle uh, are often dead. And they're also very frequently orphaned. Uh, so CDL is a fairly straightforward approach to this particular problem, which is to say, if a third party is authorized to make the physical works available in their possession, so a library has, uh, libraries in general have catalogs of work, have collections. If they can take their existing physical collections and digitize them, under a separate digitization regime, and then uh, and then possess a digital work that they might just be able to lend it one at a time to their patrons the way they would have lent the physical copy. So you have a way of getting at that 20th century black hole, making a little dent in it, using the infrastructure we already have, relying on the libraries uh, that are already responsible for making these works available to the public. So a, a pretty straightforward answer to that. It's, it's also in part an answer to this concept of the 21st century electronic cage, uh, which is to say that we have this universe of, of newer works that are digital first or they're digital only. They've never lived in a physical format or if they have the physical format is their primary way of being distributed. Libraries may not own these. They may not be allowed to own these. That is, they might not be able to purchase them on the market. Uh, these are protected by technological protective measures, which themselves are protected by law, meaning that individuals who might want to get into them, use them, distribute them, preserve them, do anything with them, uh, uh, that other than simply access, watch, or read them, um, can't do so without uh, the necessary authorization from the rights holder. These also, like the works from the 20th century, have potentially very short commercial lives. And as such, uh, we are risking a future where when they fall out of commerce, where uh, they get retired um, because for a tax write-off, or it, where the publisher simply has no interest in making them available, that nobody else has those rights. So CDL, again, fairly straightforwardly approaches the 20th century black hole. It is kind of an answer to that second question about electronic cages. It obviously doesn't break any electronic cages on its own. Libraries need to have something to lend. Um, so the concept of libraries lending digital works one at a time the way that they would physical ones and actually having digital works in their collections is a solution. Um, but in general, it's one that requires market intervention. Libraries need to be able to purchase digital works in the first place. Or, or else to be able to break the TPMs that surround works that are presently in that cage uh, in order to do that. But on both, CDL is really standing there uh, looking at very real problems, perhaps some of the biggest in cultural preservation and access um, that uh, before us and, and offering a potential solution. Uh, we are in a moment where libraries are in transition. 
Uh, so traditionally, uh, so libraries were traditionally owners of copies. They purchased their collections, they own them, they can dispose of them how they want. They're moving from owners to licensees, uh, which is to say that they're moving from a world in which the rights they have over their collections are dictated by law, uh, by the law of personal property, not to be confused with the law of copyright, although it, obviously copyright has something to say about what owners of copies can do. Uh, into a world where actually we don't really care about what the law says, what we care about is what the license agreement says. So moving from a world of usage rights set by law to one where usage rights are set by contract. Now, license restrictions can have some pretty sharp drawbacks. So uh, they can be limited in time. The license expires after 10 years. So you don't really own it if the library doesn't really own their collections if their right to distribute them ends uh, after, after a fixed set of years. They might be limited by use. So licenses that explode after say 50 or 100 people have actually downloaded the copy, they just end. They're not typically transferable. So if library X says, you know what, actually we don't need 10 copies of uh, the Great Gatsby, the, or well, that's not even uh, where we can give nine to or um, to other libraries. Well, you can't you can't do that. Um, generally, uh, they are also dependent on like, rights holder consent. So one of the things about physical goods is even if um, the a publisher Hachette Book Group doesn't want to send, sell me a copy of its latest bestseller because they say, oh, you're a library, you're going to lend it to all your friends. It doesn't really matter. There's a secondary market. And libraries can purchase a copy from other cha uh, channels, not necessarily directly from publishers. So that's not true in the world of licensing, generally not without a legal intervention. Um, they are, they in because of all these features, they can facilitate price discrimination. So where uh, certain purchasers might be obliged to pay more. So libraries, rather than paying the market price for a copy of a book, will pay the library price, which is going to be greatly inflated. They also obfuscate price transparency. So you don't necessarily know what the price, the market price is or have a hard time discerning it because you won't know the terms of other transactions from other libraries. Uh, but most importantly, this just means the libraries don't have collections. If they don't have collections, they can't fulfill preservation and stewardship missions. So this is potentially fatal for, for the future of the library in a lot of ways. Now, CDL sort of started in large part as a, you know, yes, it's, it's a concept for distributing works, but it's also a legal theory. Uh, it's a theory that under, very specifically under United States Fair Use Law, uh, that this is something that libraries can do today without any legal intervention, but they have the rights um, in the very, in, uh, the context specific ad hoc world of fair use. And this was advanced by uh, a lawyer and librarian at Georgetown, Michelle Wu, um, and then uh, really taken up as well by uh, Kyle Courtney at Harvard and Dave Hansen, formerly of Duke and now of the Authors Alliance. Um, and they make a really compelling argument. Uh, fair use is always ultimately determined by courts. Uh, but these smart people who are uh, copyright experts uh, came up with a pretty compelling case to say, hey, uh, in the four factors that courts look at for fair use on balance, uh, this is something that it doesn't destroy the market. It fulfills a really important social good library. It doesn't actually change the status quo terribly in any meaningful way. Um, that said, ultimately the courts are the arbiters. And the reason we're gonna find out probably is that the Hachette Book Group and others have, have sued the Internet Archive in the Southern District of New York. Uh, and the Internet Archive has been doing this for some years. And the publishers, particularly in the context of the COVID epidemic where, uh, where the Internet Archive relaxed its one-to-one -one lending provision temporarily, um, that, that really spurred the lawsuit on. How long it will be before we know whether it's fair use in, in the United States is going to be some time. <laughs> These cases have a tendency to be dragged out um, over years and years and years. And with a lot, and this will certainly involve appeals and probably several appeals and perhaps the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, it, it'll, it will be a moment before we resolve the question. Although that doesn't resolve the normative question of whether this should be a feature of the law of the US or a law of other jurisdictions in particular. Uh, and importantly, from my perspective as somebody who, who lives in out there in New Zealand uh, and who does, uh, who's an advocate for public interest copyright policy here, um, control digital lending is already allowed here. It's something that was seen as a problem uh, in the context of the digital revolution in 2008 when the uh, Copyright Act uh, New Technologies Amendment Bill was passed. Uh, and section now section 56A of the Copyright Act 1994 in New Zealand uh, pretty clearly communicates this concept that libraries that own digital works or that have it, obtained them lawfully uh, are allowed to communicate them to their authenticated users, um, provided that certain conditions are met. And you know, here indeed, here's the important one, which is that you can't lend more than the number of copies that they have in their collection. So it's a one-to-one -one digital lending. Now, admittedly, um, control digital lending, even though it was considered uh, considered important, considered an important safety valve 
uh, for user rights and, and for library rights in in, uh, in an evolving technological landscape, uh, this is effectively a dead letter in that uh, there are still some very open questions. And the big part here is, you know, I, I don't want don't want anybody in the audience to actually be reading the slide of uh, of statutory text, um, but uh, subsection one a says that the librarian or archivist has to obtain that digital copy lawfully in order to distribute it to the public uh, or to distribute it to its authenticated uh, users. Now, open question is what it means to obtain a digital copy lawfully. So first and most importantly, uh, most publishers don't sell digital copies, they license them. Even if they wanted to sell a digital copy, it's sort of hard to, uh, under the law, to envision how that works, given that digital copies necessarily involve copying, that means really typically they're wrapped up in licenses. So uh, there is just, it's not to say that librarians or archivists sufficiently, sufficiently motivated in New Zealand today could not be doing this. It's just that there's some fear over what it means to get that lawful digital copy. And it probably doesn't mean what they've purchased from or that they've uh, for what they've licensed directly from publishers, which means you need to be relying on another exception uh, under the Copyright Act to make that digital copy. And even then, you have to be willing to risk a lawsuit from the publishers who most certainly would bring one, uh, as you've seen uh, from the vitriol that they've had against these programs elsewhere. And in fact, um, <laughs> not many people seem to have noticed that uh, digital lending, one-to-one -one digital lending is lawful in New Zealand, because when the Internet Archive was slated to receive 600,000 books from the New Zealand's National Library, uh, which were being deaccessioned, that is, they were from the National Library's overseas published collection here, uh, and the library wanted to shed them from the collection, and found the Internet Archive was willing to accept them so that they could scan them and make them available uh, through controlled digital lending. Uh, seemed like an attractive uh, winning proposition where books that otherwise very likely are, are simply going to become landfill would instead uh, enjoy uh, a new new accessibility through control to digital lending. Uh, authors protested, um, the Author Society here and, and in Australia and internationally all protested. Um, <laughs> you can see that the local Author Society um, called call them internet pirates. Uh, eventually political pressure forced the whole plan to be paused. Uh, and the attorney general was asked to investigate. And this was a saga that um, was uh, deeply frustrating for many of us. But uh, uh, one of the uh, the biggest, most mind boggling things is that we have, we went through all this trouble in 2008 uh, to envision precisely this kind of thing happening. Uh, and the fact that it was on the law never came up once uh, in, or that there is a provision for control of the lending in New Zealand law never came up once as part of this dialogue. Uh, instead, that rhetoric about the Internet Archive necessarily being pirates or violating the law and et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum, um, that dominated the conversation here just as it has overseas. Um, and I, I'm going to, oops, I'm pretty much up on time, um, but I wanted to end with the thought that I think that when you consider how much vitriol there is on this subject, it leads you to ask why <laughs> this is such an important topic for so many in industry. And on, on the one hand, I think it's definitely about you know, straightforwardly selling books and, and trying to ensure that you can get as much money from your from your copyright portfolio as you possibly can. And that's that's always been the case. But beyond that, and I think maybe even more importantly, is that libraries and archives have had a very special place in public policy on copyright issues. They are the single largest, loudest, most important voice and the most consistent one. And even though we've had allies in the tech sector, for instance, um, in say the early 2000s, uh, those allegiances were always context specific, temporary and contextual. And I think now it's very easy to see that um, the public interest and technology company interests are not necessarily so aligned. Uh, and the, the people who have been there all along consistently defending the public interest in copyright policy have always been libraries. Uh, if we, if the, if the publishers have a way of effectively eroding libraries into nothing in the future, it's both powerful for their bottom lines, but it's also powerful for the extension um, of their view of copyright policy, which is essentially a way to guarantee a fundamentally unbalanced um, copyright regime going forward. So I think this is tremendously important. I'm, I'm excited to take questions and also excited to hear from my co-panelists uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, certainly we've already heard that uh... Certainly, we've already heard that there's a lot of polarization that happens in conversations around copyright. Uh, and uh, so thank you for cutting through uh, the hyperbole and uh, giving us a, a clear overview of the uh, CDL situation. Uh, I'm sure there'll be 
lots of questions about it. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Ellie Rennie uh, to talk us through the Web3 report. Thanks, Elliot. Just going to bring up my slides now. Hi, everyone. So, yes, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a report that I did with my now former colleague, Indigo Holcomb James, who's now at Acme, and Alana Kushnia on Web3 and the creative industries for the Australia Council for the Arts, which was released towards the end of last year. And really what we were asking in this report is this question I've put up on the screen is what happens when the internet of value, meaning um, Web3, which is blockchain enabled suite of apps and protocols that enable peer-to-peer -peer trans transfer of value, when that meets symbolic value as generated through the creative industries. So the values around aesthetics, historical value, authenticity, and social movements as well. Um, and Indigo and I study how people use technologies and adoption. We're not art critics. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave some of that to the side. Um, but really what we were finding in the report is that what's significant, particularly about NFTs, is that these are, are new ways of artists um, well, new ways for artists to manufacture ownership. So uh, Raya Myers actually calls NFTs. I think there's a quote in, a, in an interview with Mackenzie Walker where she says it's the new art of ownership um, and, you know, the, the pictures just kind of come with that. And um, it, or the, this idea from Mitchell Chan that these are like sold the LeWitt paintings, um, they're, they're just certificates, particularly with generative art, that we're purchasing. So they're important for things like provenance. But really also what they're doing is because of um, because they are artist-led and produced, they uh, we're seeing all these different ways of organising in the creative industries occurring because of them. Um, for instance, rewarding and incentivizing fans, particularly in music, um, to sustain creative projects, as well as the use of Web3 in particular to decentralize autonomous organizations for organizing and managing collaborative creative endeavors. Uh, the report also is pretty long. It covers some things because it's meant for artists. What is Web3? It's environmental impacts. We uh, surveyed and interviewed artists about their views on Web3 and Indigo did an extensive a review of the second, secondary material on what cultural institutions are doing with these technologies. But what I'm going to talk about specifically today is the chapter that Alana Kushner and I put together, um, which is uh, dealing with, with some of the legal problems that are occurring. And um, as, as you are in this audience, probably well aware, um, the problem with NFTs is that um, buyers tend to assume that they come with particular rights over the artwork. And that's not the case in most cases. So although the physical property, sorry, the, the actual property, the ownership can be transferred, it's not the case that the intellectual property rights are transferred when the asset is. Um, so what Alana and I did is I kind of went through a process, not being a lawyer, of identifying some of the questions that were arising through um, the, the research that we were doing, looking at what was available out there um, in terms of information for artists. And then Alana, who has her own legal practice, guesswork agency, helped me um, in analysing these examples. And she also wrote up a really interesting specific uh, section on resale royalties in Australia in relation to NFTs. So go check that out. Um, but the, I mean, the, the, the big message here, which I'm is probably not news to everyone there, but NFT buyers really do need to ascertain what license rights they are purchasing from the owner, if any, and creators who want to give NFT owners permission to use their work need to take affirmative steps to make that clear. Just creating an NFT doesn't achieve that. And unless this is explicitly addressed, um, it, it's not it's not at all apparent in the NFT that you purchase uh, what, what kind of rights or um, I, I suppose um, 
what license to exploit this NFT you you have. Um, and, and of course, also Australia has a resale royalty scheme. NFTs are, are quite wonderful in that they make it reasonably easy to uh, program in um, second, uh, a portion of secondary sales to come back to the artist. That doesn't, um, at the moment, take into account countries where retail royalties um, already occur, such as in Australia. So there are some notorious examples out there. You've probably heard of these. Um, probably the most notorious being Spice Dow, which purchased um, the storybook uh, by a director who was uh, going to make a version of, of June, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, I think is how you pronounce it. I don't know. But um, they, of course, just by buying, um, so, so they, they purchased the physical object and um, their intention was to make make that film because they had this storybook uh, but of course that was not allowed by um, by the author's estate another one was Jay-Z and Damon Dash who made an album together and um, Damon Dash attempted to release that album as an NFT Jay-Z said no you're not allowed to do that and in fact, I think a third was also uh, of those rights were with the record company. So while unsigned artists might be able to sell NFTs associated with their work, musicians really need to be aware of who all the rights holders are in relation to that when they're setting out to do NFTs. Um, Bored, Apes, Bored Apes Yacht Club, one of the more famous NFT projects, did develop a license so that NFT owners can produce merch which displays the ape and they can sell that. Um, for instance, mugs, indeed rugs, um, putting a new dimension to the term rug pool in NFT world. Uh, but the director and actor, Seth Green, went to make a, I think, a TV series with his ape and then his wallet was hacked and his ape was stolen. He ended up paying the ransom because you need to cryptographically prove that you own that um, particular NFT in order to be able to make use of that license. There are other issues in games, which I won't go into. Um, so I'm talking most, mostly what we're dealing with here from my understanding is, is actually licenses because transfer of copyright needs to be in writing in the US and Australia, according to Alana. So um, if an artist is employed, I mean, so, so what, I mean, for artists who are doing NFTs, a lot of these are actually very collaborative projects. They're not, they're not solo artists producing works. Um, and so they, artists do get employed to produce NFTs for companies, particularly in um, more of the branding world. And of course, that company likely retains IP unless it's negotiated in a contract. But this gets very complicated when you're talking about decentralized autonomous organizations, as in collectives of people who are doing their governance via uh, assemblages of smart contracts and other tools. Um, in a Web3 world, uh, DAOs, while, while they kind of look like community organizations or, um, or other company type formations, uh, they're, they're not recognized under Australian law. They are in a couple of places in the world, but mostly not. And so if IP requires that the author is a person or an entity, a DAO is neither. So members of, of those DAOs need to be aware of um, the potential difficulties they may get into in relation to um, the NFTs that they decide to embark upon. Um, now, there are some really fast, since we wrote the report, this one came up, there's some fascinating developments occurring. So I came across this one at DWeb Camp in California last year where Lawrence Lessig, Primavera de Philippi and Isaac Tatka presented um, an Ethereum improvement proposal that they have put forward for ERC5554, which is this remix NFT. So, of course, um, Lessig, having been, you know, the inventor of Creative Commons, is, is involved in this because some of the drawbacks as Primavera and Lessig and others see it is that while Creative Commons is a, is a great way for people to be able to share their work, uh, it's not very easy to uh, make revenue from the Creative Commons model. And you also don't necessarily get to see, well, you don't get to see um, who's been using that work and how. 
so they have created a token standard that um, if you have, if you own that NFT, you have exclusive rights for um, the time that you hold it. And I think 30 days afterwards to be able to um, use the artwork associated with that NFT uh, or music or whatever it is. Um, and also that the NFT token itself contains metadata around who else has used it before you. So it's kind of creating a chain of records around in relation to the remix. Um, and they don't see it as a problem that this might become too expensive and shut people out because there will hopefully be other derivative works from that first NFT, which would be more affordable. Um, but of course, all of all of these issues are not just about copyright and, and um, or IP generally or trademarks. Um, it's also uh, an issue for consumer law, tax law, securities law, um, a famous example being the in inventor of the Pepe meme um, who created a DAO and released a collection of 400 rare Pepe's um, saying that one would be auctioned off, but then um, that DAO proceeded to auction off, I think another 30 something uh, rare Pepe's after that. And the person who paid a lot for that first one that was auctioned went and sued um, under consumer law in America. Um, so um, we actually talk much more in depth about this and the relationship of, um, of, of law and standards and technological developments and experimentation and NFTs in a new podcast called Mutable. Our first episode is out on this topic. So please listen to that or go to the report link. But Elliot um, wanted me to, I suppose, give some thoughts about what I think um, those of you in the audience uh, might consider around around what kind of um, innovations we need in this area. Um, obviously, the first one is that it would be really wonderful to have a legal means of operating as a DAO in Australia. Um, koala, koala with a C, which is a, a collective of um, legal experts, artists, and technologists have a great report on what they call the DAO model law, which is seeking um, equivalence in corporations law for DAOs, which I highly recommend checking out. And I think it would be, we, we've started some conversations about whether that could work in Australia. I think those need to continue. Um, I think the work that's going on around putting the licenses in the NFT token itself so that consumers can see what they're actually purchasing is really important. Uh, various en entities and groups are working on that. Um, I think that one of the things, and this is a little bit of an abstract thing that, I, that I've been pondering, is that really Web3 is open modular systems um, and that that's why artists have gravitated towards it in the way that they have. And it, it, at the moment, it's what well, the activity we are seeing is is all digitally native, um, well, mostly uh, including in areas of finance, et cetera. But um, what we really need is a kind of interface or API with, with the institutions that we're all forced to um, deal with in our daily lives, whether that be, you know, the tax departments or collecting societies or whatever. And, and that to me is something that needs an enormous amount of work is, is how these new technologies can plug into that. And I think finally, um, the one of the big um, difficulties in Web3 in the creative industries is actually just around metadata practices and um, tools that enable um, governance over metadata, including dispute resolution when you um, someone's put something up on Spotify and they haven't actually attributed it correctly, for instance. And there are some, um, some good initiatives working on that. I mentioned Invoke in the report, but these are absolutely essential for, um, for, the, for the Web3 environment that artists um, actually have good metadata practices and I think artists, because of NFTs and Web3, are really beginning to become aware of the importance of metadata, which I think is a positive thing. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.
Thank you, Ellie. It's uh, it's always interesting to get an insight to how other sectors that are uh, sitting around the kind of copyright space are thinking about these technologies and using these technologies. Uh, so we'll delve into some more conversation about that in the Q&A. Uh, but now I'll hand over to Rita to uh, present to us here in the room about AI and copyright. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. I'll wait until my slides are ready. And here they are. So thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present and to come in person. It's it's really nice to move from digital environment to the real uh, life <laughs> um, kind of audience uh, here. And today I want to talk about AI and copyright. And I know that I'm the, uh, the last person before your lunch break, but I believe that this topic AI and copyright is in the mind of many of you. And that's why I'm, I'm, I encourage you to stick here and to, <laughs> to listen carefully. Hopefully you'll get some interesting and useful ideas. So, uh, so uh, I'll start with this example, the picture that we see here, maybe some of you are, um, have, uh, have an idea where it's coming from. So this, these images are generated by Lensa AI, the app that was in the news recently. It is, and it is one of those generative AI apps um, that, um, that are increasingly popular and they allow to um, generate creative works. And also they are, these apps are being trained by using creative works. And that's another example, ChatGPT, I'm sure you all heard about it. And that's uh, the, the first one, Lensa AI is, is kind of um, this image-based app, and this one is text uh, app, and it allows you to generate it complex and quite com kind of high quality text. And it's also being trained on a lot of um, text as a training material. So what issues we have uh, from copyright law perspective with relation to all these generative AI apps, uh, there are two of them. I'm sure you're aware of them. Who owns these sort of outputs, creative outputs generated by AI? And the second one is, what about the use of pre-existing copyrighted works in the process of training of these apps? And I'll focus my presentation only on the second issue today. Um, but if you have any questions about the first one, I'm happy also to discuss those. So, so what's the current legal status? So does copyright at the moment in Australia allow using copyrighted works in machine learning processes. And uh, so when this Lens AI became such a popular app um, and everyone started try, uh, trying it and putting all these images that they create out of themselves, uh, those beautiful images that you can also use and try, it's, it's beautiful, uh, and uh, uploading them uh, uh, online. Um, and also other apps like Stability AI, where you can give an instruction what to draw, uh, and they would draw you a very beautiful painting out of, uh, out of as a result of your instruction. Well, the artists, of course, started complaining. First of all, the first big issue was um, the, the sometimes these apps allow generate images in the style of a particular artist, and artists start recognizing that their style is being used, and they thought it's although it's not direct expressive copying, uh, they were of course very unhappy. And that the problem was um, the use of their content to train those apps. So for instance, this Lensa AI app is, um, and let's stability AI uh, and DALI app, all the other uh, and other apps are trained on millions or billions of pictures that are without authorization scraped from online, compiled into data set, and then you know, run through the uh, algorithms to train them so that they afterwards can generate the images to, to users. So, uh, and this, these complaints have already resulted in international litigation. So very recently, just kind of in a few couple of months, three cases were started. So first it started actually, a uh, class action in US was started against Copilot, which is uh, the app that generates new, new code based on pre-existing you know, computer codes. Uh, but for you, it might be more interesting. The other two uh, cases in US, the class action was started against Stability AI, actually the company that developed that so-called stable diffusion algorithm used in, in, in those um, examples I mentioned, both Lensa AI and Dali and so on, and, and, if, and a few other companies. So the few artists sue them claiming that such use of copyrighted works is an infringement, despite of the fact that US has a fair use exception. And in UK, we have a, 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 an action against Stability AI by Getty Images, that uh, and Getty Images argues that uh, when Stability AI used thousands of images from Getty Images website without authorization, this constitutes an infringement, uh, and and it's not covered by text and data mining exception that exists in in the UK. 
So it will be very interesting to see where it goes because these countries have exceptions for tax and data mining, different ones. One is fair use, another is tax and data mining for non-commercial purposes, and the courts will show to which extent they apply or not. Now, what about in Australia? So of course, uh, the kind of the, what we hear from artists that they don't have any rights essentially against these apps um, in Australia and um, that the kind of laws are lagging behind. At the same time, it's interesting that for the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, there has been a discussion that saying, um, especially from AI developers, that the Australian laws are too broad and they're overprotective. Laws, uh, in, as we know in Australia, we don't have text and data exception, we don't have fair use. So, um, so they say that it's, um, you know, uh, AI developers are not, uh, you know, allowed these, to do these activities and there would be an infringement. So what's actually the, the, the answer? So could Australian uh, right holders uh, or artists um, uh, win against, against such apps like Stability AI or Lensa AI? So there are a few arguments. Some, some, so uh, on the section of no, <laughs> first we, uh, we of course would argue that the outputs in many cases are not copying ex expressive elements. They are transformative. Even if the style is copied, styles, artistic styles themselves are not protected. Um, and also, um, while we have uh, copies of works being produced as a part of training process, they are temporary, and um, that's why they would be covered under existing temporary copies exceptions under Copyright Act. However, I think that there are some uh, uh, some part of the process that could be covered under current Australian copyright law. So, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, images. Uh, from online were scraped and decompiled into kind of permanent so-called Leon 5B data set, which then was used for training purposes. So this data set is permanent, so it's, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be covered by a temporary um, uh, copy exception. And also it's very questionable whether, whether it would be covered by any of a fair dealing for, for research purposes. Actually, when you look into database, they say this is the data set for research purposes only, but it's clearly being used for non for commercial purposes too. So um, uh, so it's very so I I would uh, think that's that that part of comp compiling the data sets and using it for commercial pro processes uh, you know could be covered under current copyright laws and right holders in Australia could have rights over that and could enforce those rights but the problem and we move again to back uh, to the column of no jurisdictional all these apps and data sets. Uh, that we, uh, at least as far as these exams are concerned, have been developed overseas. So the data set, this Leon 5B data set was developed by a German company in Germany. And of course, training of those apps like um, Lens AI, Stability AI took place in US and arguably Australian laws would not reach, you know, those activities outside Australia because they're territorial. Uh, so uh, are, are these good or bad news? So for, uh, so for right holders, uh, I suppose the, uh, there is a bit of good news. It means Australian uh, copyright, substantive copyright law is broader than other countries. There are no exceptions. So if, let's say, these sort of data sets are created in Australia and they're used um, um, even actually kind of for research purposes, I, I would argue, because our fair dealing research exception uh, is, is actually quite interpreted quite narrowly, I think right holders would be protected, um, but the problem, of course, if it happens overseas. So we have jurisdictional issue. Now for AI industry in Australia, it's probably not a very good news because in, they they essentially would be breaching Australian laws if they develop you know, data sets and do you know, tra training activities in Australia because there is no exception. Uh, or it doesn't mean, of course, that we have to um, kind of give the immediate and full preference to one another stakeholder. We need to look at the broader societal interests. And here, of course, we have to remember that on the one hand, we could argue that um, we want AI industry to flourish in Australia. It produces a lot of great uh, out, uh, kind of outputs. And even those generative AI apps, they could be not only used for pleasure, but also could be used by businesses to develop their you know, covers for magazines that had been already happening for books and so on. And they, the outcomes, uh, like the outputs uh, are much cheaper and uh, more or sometimes free. So it could you know, support our industry. On the other hand, we would say, well, if we, um, if we really 
pre prefer AI industry and get all the, the rights to use this content without authorization for free, uh, for you know, in a long term, creative industries would suffer. And we know that argument that incentive would go down, and our both eco economy and cultural uh, it would affect our economy and cultural identity if 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 there's a demise of creative industries. Now it's very difficult to exactly know what would happen. So um, in this context, so what we what we should do about the current situation? Do we need to do anything at all? So I suppose in every policy discussion, we need to kind of decide which you know kind of policy priorities we take and like who kind of uh, what is what is um, you know um, the prince the guiding principles. And I suggest these principles, which I suppose you know I hope you know everyone would agree with that. First, of course, we want to encourage AI industry has a lot of benefits, but also we want to take into account right holders' interests. Uh, even if not granting them full exclusive control over the use of their works in, in training context, but at least certain, you know, certain control. So if we accept these principles, we have three options. Do nothing, fair use, and TDM exception. So if we will start with, TD, uh, with doing nothing, well, uh, that's what's been doing, uh, that's what we've been doing for, 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 for a while now. And... Uh, <laughs> It's not entirely bad idea. Theoretically, it means that AI developers, at least those you know uh, doing those uh, training activities in Australia, have to go and get permission and pay licensing fees for ride holders, and hopefully some of them will, you know, reach authors. Um, however, uh, and we of course want to support our creative industries. It's a few their data is a fuel to you know to a um, in, in 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 AI economy and. Um, and the fuel is not free. But there are a few problems with this um, kind of current situation. First of all, uh, uh, there is a lack of optimal licensing mechanism. So of course, it's why developers imagine they need a data, a huge data set uh, of thousands or millions or billions of pictures to train a really good module and how to get that license. In many cases, you know, you, uh, I mean, individual licensing often doesn't work. You go have to go to collective licensing. In some sectors, collective licensing is better developed, like text and, and music. In other sectors, like pictures, images, is, is very little represented by collecting society. Um, and uh, even um, in, uh, in those um, sectors where uh, collective licensing is better developed, it doesn't cover many works like no, those under copy uh, under creative industries licenses and so on. So, and there is no compulsory or extensive licensing schemes in Australia, especially with relation to those uses. Um, uh, now, the uh, other problem is for AI developers in Australia. If you think uh, overseas AI developers don't have to pay for those uses, at least for in non-commercial context at all. In UK, in Europe, in uh, in US, they can develop those you know projects at least for non in non commercial context without paying. So of course, Australian AI developers get into uncompetitive position, or um, uh, and 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 um, you know we we want probably our industry to compete in the national market on equal legal basis or like compar comparable equal basis. And the third problem is um, how much money. Let's assume that AI developers get licenses, pay those money how much of those money will reach uh, Australian riot holders and Australian authors? So uh, as we know, Australia is a net importing country of creative uh, outputs, which means that a lot of content that will be licensed will come from overseas and a lot of money will go overseas. Out of those money that stays in Australia, how much money will go to major ride holders and how much of money and whether at all would trickle to our authors? So that's that's uh, another, and we have to keep in mind that uh, a lot of those apps uh, used in, let's say, US and Europe and so on, when they're being developed, they, they, no money will come to Australian authors at all. So AI developers in overseas are not paying Australian authors and right holders, while you know our AI companies would have to pay you know overseas right holders, and that would be the major recipient of those licensing fees. So uh, keeping in mind in th this in mind, I think this, uh, this current situation doing nothing is not satisfactory. We need to do something. One option is fair use, but I also just skipping it. There's been too much debate. We all know all the arguments for and against. <laughs> let's uh, let's leave it for some other occasion. <laughs> and um, I would go to TDM exception. So we know that specific TDM exceptions, specifically for text and data mining, which also applies to machine learning, already exists in a number of jurisdictions. Like in UK, there is TDM for non-commercial purposes. They suggested last year to expand it to all purposes, including commercial, but now they seem to reconsider this 
uh, suggestion because of big backlash from uh, creative industries. In EU, they have text and data mining for commercial, so sorry, for non-commercial and for commercial purposes. But if, t if machine learning um, is for commercial purpose, right holders have an option to opt out. So they have that opportunity to opt out and get and then ask for licenses or not participate in the project at all. And Japan, there's a TDM both for commercial and non-commercial. So we see those exceptions, the scope varies. But what's what it what means that despite of those, you know, all that's always conflict of interest, there is an opportunity to find a compromise solution that to a certain extent meets the interests of both AI, you know, let's say developers and creative industries. And so I would suggest that, you know, as a next step. For Australia, I think two points needs to be discussed. I, I believe that TDM is an option, TDM exception is an option to consider to address the current problems. And now one, one question is, uh, what's the scope? What sort of uses in machine learning processes we want to include in the, in the exception and which ones we want to exclude? Like for instance, non-commercial, non commercial use divide, is that the one that like adopted in Europe and in UK? Is it something that we also want to adopt or not? And the other important one is for, for those uses that are not covered or will, will not be covered by TDM exception, let's say if it's about commercial use, how we want to improve licensing. Because the fact that it's not you know, covered by exception doesn't mean that automatically it converts into money for Australian right holders. We need to think about how to improve those current licensing mechanisms, maybe look into how into overseas, how they've, doing, how they've done that, how, for instance, opt-out mechanism in Europe functions and whether right holders manage to utilize that opt-out mechanism for, for really tangible benefit. And, and improve that side because that that this this would be addressing also the interests of uh, uh, our um, right holders and of course um, referring back to the discussion previously how those money that come into Australian let's say, right or industry how do how we make sure that authors actually get them too okay and so this is my conclusion so use of content uh, uh, copyright content in machine learning a context is an actual problem and an urgent problem that we need to kind of seriously talk about. We see cases are coming up and who knows uh, if we will have any case in Australia soon. And Australia is lagging behind in their search for policy solutions. Um, if compared to other jurisdictions, I suppose we all agree that we need to take into account interest of you know both main stakeholder groups in Australia and not to kind of um, clearly, you know, put just one of them up front. That's why we need a compromise solution. And I suppose TDM exception could be a, a good option where those interests could be balanced and we need to discuss exact parameters. What is excluded, what is included, and can we make sure that, um, that, that you know, also licensing for excluded uses uh, properly operated. Thanks so much. Happy to take any questions when, when, when the time comes, yeah. Thank you, Rita. Um, I, I guess all three of our presenters who uh, the two joining us on the interwebs will be back on screen in a moment, hopefully. Uh, all three of our speakers have, uh, you know, really looked at the fact that copyright, while it is often an issue in these areas, is for at least some uh, stakeholders using these types of technologies is not the first consideration. Uh, and so I think it's an interesting proposition, this idea that, uh, you know, people who are interested in the copyright space, you know, to what extent is it our role to try to address the issues and fix them as opposed to leaving uh, industries that are essentially forging ahead regardless, uh, you know, in that space. So uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions. So anybody from the audience got a question for any of our panelists? Hopefully our two online panelists will rejoin us on screen. There they are. Hello. <laughs> questions? No questions. Nobody's interested in technology. <laughs> no. Trish.
Thanks all. Um, I guess the question primarily to read it, but very interested in other people's take on it as well. You know, Australia is a fairly small jurisdiction. Um, obviously, a lot of the heat in these around these issues is happening at an international level. And I'm just wondering how successful you think we would be to look towards forging a, an Australian specific solution, or is it more a, a situation of hanging back and seeing what the international consensus turns out to be? Yeah, well, I, I agree that we have to look what's happening internationally because these businesses do function internationally and they want to kind of similar, if not identical laws. Um, and uh, and that's why when we develop a solution for Australia, it has to kind of, um, I think, to try to align with the already existing solution to a certain extent. And I, I think if we look at these countries that have made effort, there's already kind of a sort of consensus coming up. Uh, they say that, yes, we need some, you know, we want some some sort of exceptions. Uh, I mean, those the most progressive countries. And the question is like the scope now. And that's the discussion is still going on. And, uh, you know, I think we need to join that and see what's, what's, what's the most reasonable scope. Uh, I mean, I don't think, though, that we have to sit and wait until some international solution is developed and then we join it. And why? I think because those international solutions, that's the problem, are often developed by countries that are in different situations in Australia. Maybe they are uh, uh, content in exporting countries, so they have different interests than Australia. And then when the solution is developed, we just have to join it or not, and we don't have a chance to input it to represent interests of a smaller um, jurisdiction with, let's say, you know, um, different creative industry situation. So I would, you know, I would actively encourage, you know, to to articulate and to understand our real needs, needs of our industries, and what what sort of um, what sort of position would be most useful for us, and then um, you know, advocate it both on an international level, like um, in the discussions, and of course, um, adopting it at, at national level. I'll just chime in with my two cents here, which is that limitations and exceptions are have mercifully uh, largely been left to uh, domestic decision makers. And I think that, that that has its problems in the sense that we have obviously have ever harmonizing upward um, copyright protections. Uh, but there's never going to be, there is not any international consensus about pretty much any issue in acceptance of limitations aside from, say, um, Marrakesh and for uh, access for the blind and for disabled, and that's probably <laughs> that might be the uh, the end of the consensus that we see in our lifetime. So, I, in the absence of that, I think forging ahead is the only uh, the only available option, and I think it is actually practically available. And for the most part, even in these big sweeping trade agreements that do exert quite a lot of pressure uh, on on states like Australia, like New Zealand, to uh, uh, to take actions to extend the scope of protection, to extend copyright terms, et cetera, et cetera. They haven't actually proven to be that interested in limiting the scope of limitations and acceptance. I think exactly because nobody has a link to stand on here. Everybody has their own view. So the opportunity is there. Largely what we're talking about here are things that sound in limitations and exceptions. So absolutely, <laughs> Australia should do its own thing. It should do it wholeheartedly. Um, and you know, it should take bold positions. I, I, ideally, I, I, although... Australia has everywhere. Uh, the political economy of copyright is messy and um, and scary. And any time that these issues are open for debate, and any time you have copyright reform on the table at all, you know, I think everybody has to you know <laughs> it is a little bit white knuckled getting through it um, because it you know bad things are just as likely to happen as good. But uh, yeah, got to have some faith in the I guess our collective ability to. Um, you know, as, as democracies to, to forge uh, smart policy. Ellie, anything you want to add? Uh, maybe not specifically on this topic. I think that um, it, it's definitely the case that nation state laws are, when it comes to Web3, are a kind of competitive issue. So we see um, the ecosystem grow in places that are more conducive to it and, and perhaps copyright is one area that um, Australia could take a lead in. Uh, but um, I'm probably more interested in the kind of areas that Primavera de Philippi calls exclusure, like Creative Commons, where there are um, things that are defined by what they're not 
um, in relation to law. And uh, I think that that's, that's probably the, the biggest area for innovation here with NFTs anyway. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yep, we've got one over here. If anybody else has one, raise your hand so we can move the mic across in between. Hello, uh, this is a question specifically for Michael, uh, just to do with the C, um, CDL. I'm wondering on, I just wanted to hear your opinion on whether or not you think that the Internet Archive, some of the issues that have come up around them attempting to employ the CDL is whether or uh, they've already kind of got this image of, I, I guess, a bit of a piracy factory, because as much as there is a lot of public domain material that's available on the Internet Archive, uh, just off the top of my head, some of the things I've come across in my job, they've got complete scans of the 300 digital uh, graphic novel, which is very much still in copyright by Dark Horse. They've got uh, an entire catalog of the initial D anime soundtracks in very high resolution files. And I just wondered if you're uh, on your opinion of this, if perhaps they hadn't come in with this baggage, whether or not it might have actually made it a little bit easier for themselves to come in with a, if they had this clean slate we just a, hey, we want to run this as a, a thing. So I'm wondering if people's kind of preconceived notions maybe have clouded this issue of CDL for them. You know, I, I think that's a good question. And there's, you, if you had to pick your defendant <laughs> in this fair use case, it's, um, I think the Internet Archive is actually, it's tremendously well-informed. They have really smart people um, who have been advising them on the copyright and that's this from the beginning. And uh, that said, obviously, I think you're right. There is an image issue there relative to, say, if it were um, Georgetown Law Library, which is one of the early pioneers in space, they would be a much more sympathetic defendant. Although I, I think it's important to not confuse two aspects of like what, of what the Internet Archive does. One is that they are a, uh, a host of user uploaded works, so user generated content. So in that, that side of what they do is a notice and take down um, uh, protected space. So uh, users are make certain promises and representations that what they're uploading is not infringing. Uh, Internet Archive operates under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States, whereby they have to take down works that are flagged to them, and, and they do that. And all of that activity exists um, and can continue to exist, and almost actually without controversy, the same way that infringing materials on YouTube uh, without controversy because of uh, notice and take down under the DMCA. The other half of what they're doing, where they're affirmatively acquiring books, scanning the books themselves, putting those books online, and, and this is all falling under the ages of open library, um, that is where we're really talking about controlled digital engine. And that's where they're lending them out one at a time, saying that, yes, these works are in copyright. We know they're in copyright. If they, if they were in the public domain, we would not lend them out one at a time. We let anybody download them at any time for free. And that, that's what they do with their public domain titles. So CDL is designed for in-copyright works. And the goal is we want to make them available and we want to make them more broadly available than they would be if, say, uh, the, their owners are, are failing to, to keep them commercially active. So two distinct issues, um, that, but, they, it, but because this one operation, uh, the Internet Archive, is in, has a foot in both, both in user uploads and in their own scanning activity, yeah, it, it definitely um, could tarnish their, their apparent reputation. But uh, you have to have some hope that um, the court hearing the case will be sophisticated enough or, or a jury, God help us if it gets that far, um, uh, to, to tease those things apart. But um, it yeah, could be a rough road ahead. <laughs> I, I think the general public would have issues define, like have, defining those into two halves. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, the site is doing this stuff, so therefore this other stuff mm -hmm. they want to do was obviously bad as well. I, I think yeah. they're making the job too easy for their detractors to make an argument against it for them. You know, and I think an important point here is that if you know, one of the realities of fair use law is that the Internet Archive can lose this case Right? And they're, they're, they can have an injunction against them and their CDL operations can be shut down. And that's not necessarily the end of controlled digital lending under a fair use rationale in the context of the United States. It doesn't foreclose it from actors who are differently situated and who are managing their programs differently. So it isn't, which, is, which isn't to say that it wouldn't be a serious blow. It would be. Um, and, and ultimately, I think that whether you're in a fair use regime or not, the ideal scenario is to have a law on the books that says, hey, this is what <laughs> this is what you can do um, as a library to make your works available so that people can take advantage of it without worrying about a fair use lawsuit, which is um, easy to bring and tremendously difficult to defend. 
Thank you, Michael. It's a good question. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, we probably have time for one more question, if there is any. Okay, maybe there is no questions. It is right at lunchtime, so generally lunch takes preference over questions, I find. Um, so uh, before I let you all go, please join me in thanking the panelists for the session today. And, and just before you all leave, I know we've been talking a lot about digital content and digital products, but of course, we all know the joy of being able to have and hold a physical product. Uh, you know, one of the best of those, of course, being books. And so I'd like to take this moment to let you all know that uh, books related to the forum today are available from the NLA bookshop, uh, particularly Corey and Rebecca's book is available and they'll be doing some signing during the lunch break. Uh, we also have um, copies of Terry Jenke's uh, uh, True Tracks book available at the bookshop as well uh, and Wi-Fi, a book to which Ellie Rennie contributed a chapter. So they're all available and there is a discount for uh, attendees of the forum. So I encourage you to have and hold a copy or more of each of them uh, and get them from the NLA bookshop while you enjoy your lunch. Thank you.